This morning, as you can see, is from John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. John 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I was just handed a note that the uh, Callahans are trying to get out of the driveway right now, and there's a black Saturn that needs to, to move in order to help them to get out. It's a black Saturn that's parked right over here in the driveway. If you would kindly go pull out and let them by and then just pull right back in, uh, I'll try to catch you up when you get back in here in about a minute or so. But it is a black Saturn that needs to be moved. We have been discussing Discipleship 101 and the importance of being the disciples that Jesus has called for us to be. Discipleship is something that we often talk about in the church, but we haven't always defined what that means and how it is we are to carry those things out. And so that has been a part of the reason for the lesson that we have been uh, engaged in for several weeks now. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus says, If any man desires to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow after me. If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone desires to be my disciple, if you want to, to do what I'm doing, if you want to be what I am, you have to deny yourself take up your cross and follow me would you pray with me please heavenly father we thank you so much for the blessings of this day and the blessings of this hour we're so grateful for this time of worship which you have uh, asked for us to engage in for our benefit and for your glory and we pray father as we enter into a time where we look into your word that you would speak to our hearts and minds that you would instruct us in the things we need to change, that you would strengthen us in those things that we are doing correct. And in all of these things, Father, we pray that you and Jesus would receive all the honor and glory. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we've looked into this idea of Discipleship 101, we've noted that a disciple is one who's being trained by a teacher, and discipleship is living out those instructions of that teacher. And so we've, we've brought a a definition together for ourselves that a disciple is a devoted follower of Jesus. There are a lot of followers. Jesus had a lot of followers in his day, but they were not devoted. And we want to be devoted followers of Jesus. And so as we look to our scripture reading and beyond in John chapter 8, I want to look at a few things here briefly before we uh, enter into some of the practical applications. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered and said, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not, all, uh, does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. May God bless the reading of his word. What a beautiful section of scripture. And so much of this has been taken so far out of context. You know, it seems to me that uh, almost everybody on the planet knows that if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. But very few people know the context in which that statement is made. The opening part of that statement tells us that we've got to abide in his word. You have to remain in his word. You have to make your dwelling in his word. 
That has to be our foundation. We talked about that at the end of our lesson last week as we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, If any uh, man hears my words and does them, I will, uh, he will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The foundation was a rock. It was a solid place. And when the storms of life came, that house continued to stand because it was founded on the rock, on the foundational principles that Jesus lays out for us and on the foundation that is Jesus Christ himself. If we want to remain in his word, we have to apply ourselves to his word. Then you will know the truth. You, you can't know the truth if you're not in the Word. Because the truth to the world is just whatever we decide it is. I mean, we, we change truths all the time. You know, we, we change laws. And some of them are changed for good reasons and some for not so good reasons. You know, there were, there were laws back many years ago that are still on some books, you know, where you couldn't spit tobacco on the sidewalk. You know, we kind of think that's kind of a silly, archaic rule today, but back during that time when uh, ladies' uh, dresses were dragging along the, the boarded sidewalks, they didn't want that tobacco spit all over their dresses. It's just what it was. Some laws are changed for good, some maybe not so. But you can't know the truth if you're not in the Word. It's not going to come to you by osmosis. The truth the world teaches, it just is what it is. The truth, and I'll get to the second part of the statement I've got on the board in just a moment. The truth will then make us free. If we remain in the Word, that truth of that Word will make us free. Now in verse 36, Jesus says, If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. A little bit later in John, John uh, Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there's no contradiction here between Jesus the Son making us free and the truth setting us free because they are one and the same. They are one and the same. And so if the Son makes you free, you are truly free. That's what it means, free indeed. Truly free. It's not a false illusion of freedom. It's not a partial freedom. It is a complete and total true freedom that you have. And as a result, you are truly my disciples. This is, this is amazing what Jesus is telling us here. It's so simple. It's a great formula that we want to follow. And so if we want to know how to truly be his disciples, we've got to remain in his word. We've got to learn from it. We've got to grow from it. We've got to apply those things in our lives. And we want to look at a section today that's going to help us to do that very thing. In Philippians chapter 2, we want to look at the first 18 verses. And we're not going to... Uh, parse out every one of these verses, but some major principles from these verses are, are absolutely worthy of consideration. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, that, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice of service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is expressing some very critical things to a church that was filled with love. But just because they were filled with love did not mean that they did not have some shortcomings. And he is advising them to look into these things that they can be better disciples, better brothers and sisters in Christ. I want us to examine a few of these things for just a few minutes. First of all, there's like-mindedness in verse 2. He says, fulfill my joy in being like-minded. This is a very important thing. We've got to be convinced in our own minds that we are one body and we're working together. If we're not, we're not going to accomplish the things that we set out to accomplish. We have to convince ourselves in our mind that we all believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came to this earth, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived among men, that he ministered for three or more years, that he went to a Roman cross, he died, he paid the penalty for the sins that are mine and yours and everybody else's, died on that cross, was buried on the third day he rose. For about 40 days he was seen walking on the earth, and he ascended to heaven, and he's coming back. we got to believe that. we got to be like-minded in that belief. And if somebody is here today and you don't believe that, I want to talk with you. I want to sit down with God's Word, I want to study it with you, and help you to see what God's Word teaches about those things. We need to be like-minded with regard to the Lord's body, His church, as to what constitutes worship, as to what constitutes salvation. We've got to understand the importance of things like sharing in the Lord's Supper, the importance of, of giving of our means, of offering prayers, of singing songs of praise, using our bodies as an instrument to God, our hearts, our spirit, our voice, lifting up praise to God. We need to be like-minded where those things are concerned. We need to be like-minded about what is a work of the church and what is a work of an individual. You know, I can't be a mother to your children. Only the mother can be a mother to their child. I can't be a father to your children. Only the father can be a father to the child. And there are many other areas. We can encourage you. The body can come around you and encourage and help you in those things. But we have got to be like-minded. We've got to understand our place in the world as God's people. And we have got to have the same love for one another. The word love here is agape. That's the God so loved the world that Pete was just bringing to our attention around the table. This agape love is not conditioned on another person's actions or their response. We love them despite how they treat us. We love them despite how they respond to what we do. That's what God does for us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. When? After we got our act together or before? Before. His love was not conditioned on our response. His love was conditioned on his love, period. 
And that's what we've got to be like-minded. We've got to love each other. You want the body to grow? You've got to love your brothers and sisters. You want the world to know that God has sent His Son Jesus into the world? We've got to love your brothers and sisters. That's a part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. In the same love and in one accord. It means we're to be harmonious, united in spirit. It doesn't mean that we're robots and we all just do exactly the same thing. Harmonious, we sing in four parts. Well, actually, we sing in five. We've got soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and then something that the rest of you are singing. <laughs> just kidding. Just want to make sure everybody's still awake. But we sing in four parts. We don't all, there are times when we sing in unison, but for the most part, we're singing different parts. That's what harmonious is. We're all carrying out different things and different talents using those things in the church, and they're in harmony with one another. You know, if, if we were all one thing, we would be deficit in so many different areas. But the fact in the body, we have so many different talents, we're able to to spread our talents out and accomplish so many things harmoniously. We need to be, as disciples of Jesus, we've got to be like-minded. Number two, we've got to be exercising humility. Verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We've got to thoughtfully consider others better than ourselves. That's the person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you. That's the person on the other side of the auditorium from you, the one who's downstairs or upstairs from you. We have to thoughtfully consider that everybody else is better than me. And not in some kind of um, self-deprecation. Uh, but because if we view others as, not that we're low, but they're better. If we view everybody better, how are we going to treat them? Because how do you treat those that you disregard? We don't, we don't treat people fairly in that situation. We, we see people as better than ourselves. Folks, that is the first step to humility, is recognizing those things and, and being so in love with God that we're, just, we're thankful that God put us here and I want to do everything for your children that I possibly can. Looking out for the interest of others also, now that verse 4 tells us we're not to neglect our interest. You know, you, you, don't, you don't forget to pay your mortgage because you paid somebody else's mortgage. You got to look out for your own interest. You got to take care of yourself. So Paul says, don't, don't just look out for your own interest, but for the interest of others also. You got to take care of yourself. God gave you the means to take care of yourself. If you're going to take care of somebody else, make sure you got things in order and then take care of them. But see them as better than yourself. And that's a hard thing to do. But that's Christ likeness. That's that's called being a disciple. Jesus said, "Take up your cross." You know what your cross looks like? It looks like making everybody better than you. That's a part of it. And it's not easy. Also, with regard to humility, we're given the ultimate example of humility in verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This idea of robbery means something to be held tightly to. You know, if you're shipwrecked and you're floating out there on the water and you're about to drown and that Coast Guard helicopter shows up and they drop a line down there to you, 
how, how tightly are you going to hold on to that thing? Well, it depends on if you want to live or not, right? You're going to hold on to it with everything you got. That's the idea of this word robbery. You're going to hold on to it and not let go of it for any reason at all. And Jesus did not consider equality of form with God. He was obviously subject to his father, but they were equal in form. He said, I'm not going to hang tightly onto that. I'll, I'll happily humble myself. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. But he made himself of no reputation. Before God, human beings have no reputation. That's you and me. We have no reputation before God. Made himself of no reputation and taking the form of a bondservant and being found in the likeness of man. And being found in likeness as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Do we understand what Jesus did? This humble attitude of Christ, Jesus, is our example for humility. Jesus considered all of you and every other person who is living or has lived or will live considered everybody else above himself. What did Paul say? Don't look out only for your own interest, for the other interests of others. What did Paul say? Consider others better than yourself. What did Jesus do? Do you think he was better than everybody else? Nope. Was he better than everybody else? Absolutely. But he humbled himself. And he took your sins and 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 my sins and he made them his sins on that cross. And he paid that price. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That, that's humility. That is our example of what that looks like. His example of humility far surpasses anything that we could ever do in a trillion years. We can't even put a drop in the bucket of what he did for us. But yet, that is our goal. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You want to truly be his disciple? Here's what you got to do. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. You are not better than anybody else. And that is, that is so hard for us to come through so many times. The beautiful part of it is in the second part of that same section, which says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Do you, did you see that? In heaven. That's all the celestial beings. The, all the angelic host on earth, all of the living humans under the earth, all of those who have died, every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. Every knee. Beautiful thing that God has done. But lastly, I want us to look at the proper attitude that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to like-mindedness, we're supposed to exercise proper humility, and now to have a proper attitude. Remember, if you abide in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, wait a minute, Paul. I got a complaint. I'm going to dispute that statement. Isn't that how we like to see those things? Now, all... Oh, no complaining, no disputing. But then I'm going to have some of that, right? Isn't that how we like to do things? Do all things without complaining and disputing. He's talking about their relationships with each other. How they go about being disciples in community together. In the name of Jesus Christ, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked 
and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. Let's look at this attitude for just a moment. First of all, if we have like-mindedness and humility, and we're not going around complaining and disputing about everything, I think some folks wake up in the morning, and, and before they can even have their coffee, they've already got a list of grievances that they're going to hold to themselves that day. They go through life, and they're, they're constantly offended and grieved and, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, oh, that preacher, woo, you know, and we go through all those things. These elders, I don't know what they're thinking. We go through all of these kinds of, of mindsets, and, you know, unless you know the whole story, you don't know the story. Same about a brother or sister in Christ that may not be in a decision-making pro- uh, position in the church. You know? We don't know everybody's backstory. We don't know what they're dealing with. You know, right now, and I mentioned this on Wednesday night. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just I, I, I'm going to brag on my little brother, right? Because he needs a lot of bragging right now. My dad, uh, my dad has moved down to Florida to be with my brother. For those that don't know, my father is blind. He's 81 and a half years old, and he'd be, he'd been totally blind for two years, been becoming blind for about the last six or seven years. He's very visually stimulated. So losing his vision, he's lost all bearing on everything. And my brother built a house on his property for my dad to live in so he could have independence but just be out the back door so to speak so my brother could see about him and my brother's in the process of taking all kinds of things my dad's wife is in the nursing home down there in florida going through uh, rehab and physical therapy because she had a fall several weeks ago and she's she's not doing well and my dad's worried about her and then my brother's taking care of both of them and my brother had four fusions in his back about nine years ago in his lower back. And either in the course of my dad's move or through something with his granddaughter as she's pushing on his chest and leaps out away from him and he reaches for her and grabs her, he bent a titanium screw in his back. And he's down right now. But you know what he's doing? He's still taking care of my father to his own detriment. Now, we've got to have the proper attitude about things. Now, he's he's had a couple of complaints. And there's only one to two people here that know my dad and probably understand his complaints because they know who my dad is. But for the most part, my brother has been giving yeoman's duty to this thing and putting his nose to the grindstone and taking care of my dad so that in my dad's golden years, he can have the best quality life possible. Whether it's the next week, the next month, or the next 10 years, we don't know. But trying to give him the best quality life that he can have because he can't live by himself anymore. His wife can't take care of him. And and he's blind. He needs someone to take care of him. And my brother is doing that. And he's doing it without complaints. And he's doing it without disputes. And he's doing it to his own detriment. Folks, we need to be doing that for each other. When you see somebody, take care of it. If you can't take care of it, come find me or one of the elders or one of the deacons or somebody who can help and we'll take care of it. We'll, We'll... pool our resources, we'll figure it out, and we'll take care of it. But we can't if we don't know. Now, there was one lady in a church I preached in a long time ago. And whenever she would go to the hospital, she would not tell me she was in the hospital. 
She wouldn't let anybody at church know she was in the hospital so that when she got out, she could complain about the preacher not coming to visit her. She did it many times in the four years I was there. Many times. You should have seen the look on her face when I found out she was in the hospital one time and I showed up in her room. Took all the joy out of her life. I can suck the joy out of her room so fast. But we, we've got to, we got to take care of each other and we've got to let each other know when we have needs. When there are things that need to be addressed, we need to help one another. And as we go through it, we need to become blameless, harmless, and without fault. Blameless, no unrepented of sin. Keeping those short accounts with God and short accounts with our brothers. Harmless, doing no harm. We've got a number of medical people here. The Hippocratic Oath ultimately comes down to do no harm. You're trying to help, but don't do any harm. And that needs to be the Christian, the disciple needs to be doing no harm without fault going through and doing the best we can to accomplish whatever the thing is that is before us proper attitude number two being torch bearers for christ at the end of verse 15 among whom this crooked generation he's talking about among whom you shine as lights in the world we're torch bearers for christ going about our business now, if our brothers and sisters have complaints against us, what do you think the world's going to think? How bright is that light going to shine? It's not. We need to let our light shine. Going back to Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do they light a candle and put it under a basket but they put it on a lampstand that it may give light to the whole house. You're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Torch bearers for Christ. But you can't do that if you don't have the right attitude. Like-mindedness, humility, and going about your business without complaining and disputing. Lastly, a word sharer holding fast the word of life whenever somebody comes to you and asks you for the difference that is within you say well thank you I've, I've been working on this I've been working really hard I got 75 self help books in my library you know, maybe some people are doing pretty good because of those self-help books, but I'm going to tell you something. There's no change that will overcome you like the change that Jesus Christ does for you. And, you've got, and you learn that through his word. Apply yourself to his word. And then be a sharer of that word as opportunities present themselves. You don't want to be obnoxious. You don't want to use God's word to drive people away, as some people have been prone to do. We want to use God's word to draw people to God. You know, we, we've got, we've got to let our light shine. We've got to have this proper attitude. We've got to be blameless, harmless. But we, we've got to be blameless, harmless, and without fault when we're sharing God's word, too. We've got to share it correctly with the right attitude. Knowing, listen very carefully to me knowing that that person that we're talking to was us once upon a time. If you are saved by the blood of Christ, that means you have been lost. You can't be saved if you weren't lost. If you have been forgiven, clothed in Christ, that means there was a time when you were not forgiven and you were naked in your sins just like whoever that other person is. Treat them the way that you, if you were in that position or if you remember where you were, treat them the way that you want to be treated. That's Matthew seven twelve. Whatever you would that men do to you, do likewise unto them. Folks, we have got to become true disciples. If you abide in my word, 
you are my disciples indeed, truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We're going to have another lesson based upon this very same thing that we're going to have uh, in our next in our series. And we're not going to go through every aspect of it, but I'm trying to get you to see the main points of what Jesus and by extension through his apostles, what they are trying to get us to see as to how we conduct ourselves and how we live every day as a disciple of Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is. It is truly a blessing to be a disciple. And here we are, and we have this great opportunity before us. And you know, our brother was talking about the Christmas season. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are talking about uh, Matthew chapter 2, and Luke chapter 4, and several other places in the Scripture this time of year. Look for those open doors to talk to them, to share with them. And then ultimately help them to see we don't worship a baby in a manger. We worship a risen Savior. Because he didn't stay a baby. He grew up. He became a man. He went to that cross. He died for the sins of the world. He was buried. He was raised the third day. And he's ascended to heaven. That's the one we're worshiping. And that's the one we're looking forward to his return. Do you believe that? Do you believe that today? Are you willing to confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Repenting of the sins for which Jesus died and being buried in water that is baptized for the remission of your sins? Being raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, clothed in Christ, covered by His blood? If you have not done those things, we can help you with that today and you can start your walk as a disciple today. Today. Let us help you. Let us encourage you. Maybe you've done those things. Maybe last year, 10 years, maybe 50 years ago. It doesn't matter. But if things have become a little frayed in your life, maybe your relationship isn't what it needs to be with Christ right now. Maybe your relationship isn't what it needs to be with a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe with a family member. Maybe you're, you're struggling with your work situation. Maybe you're struggling with a health situation. Something else is creating discouragement in your life. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us lift you up today. Let us treat you as better than ourselves. Won't you make that known to us as together we stand and sing?